And then there was the epilepsy program, and you know, uh, John Freeman and uh, Patty Vining were just uh, the most wonderful people you can imagine to work with. Uh, John had such a wealth of knowledge uh, about uh, pediatric epilepsy and what to do about it. And uh, at, at one point in 1995, 85, he came to me and he said, Ben, uh, there's a girl out in Colorado who's having 130 seizures a day. They've even put her into pentobarbital coma for two weeks. And as soon as she wakes up, the seizures start up again. What would you think about doing a hemispherectomy? An operation in which you remove half of the brain. Well, you know, interestingly enough, the first hemispherectomy was done right here at Johns Hopkins by Walter Dandy, way, 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 way back, uh, late 20s, early 30s. Uh, it uh, didn't work out the way they wanted, but uh, it had rises and falls. And by by the time we were talking about, it had fallen way out of favor for quite some time. But uh, you know, Dr. Freeman had had some experience with the neurosurgeons when he was at Stanford many, many years ago, and he thought that this would be a good idea. So you know, by that time, I had uh, developed quite a bit of faith uh, in his judgment, and uh, so we decided to uh, to proceed with a hemispherectomy on that little girl. And uh, it turned out to be spectacularly successful. She happened to be quite photogenic, as was her mother. And uh, you know, it was a big spread in the uh, Washington Post. And uh, that engendered a lot of excitement about hemispherectomies. And we were doing hemispherectomies from every place uh, in a very short period of time. And uh, I remember out of the first 14, though, interestingly enough, 13 of them were female. And I remember at a press conference, one of the reporters said, uh, why are so many females? Does this only work in female patients? And um, you know, I said, well, no, it works in females because they only use half of their brain anyway. But uh, <laughs> at which time, uh, Patty Vining chimed in and said, no, 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 that's not the reason it works. It works because they only need half their brain to be as smart as men. So <laughs> it worked. There was a touche moment. Of course, I was just kidding. I know women actually use much more than half their brain. Um, but at any rate, uh, we sp expanded into uh, lots of different types of uh, surgery beside the hemispherectomies. And uh, much of that work now, uh, John has retired. Uh, I don't do seizure surgery anymore. Dr. Jallo, uh, Dr. Vining, Dr. Hartman, uh, have uh, continued to work very diligently with the program and moving it to really uh, the next level. But uh, we discovered uh, that using a lot of the techniques, the gridding techniques, that we could isolate uh, very difficult uh, tumors. In this particular case, this little girl was from South Carolina and uh, she was having intractable seizures. The tumor appeared to be in a very eloquent uh, area of the brain. And we did monitoring and discovered that you know, all the speech functions really were, uh, were sort of an anterior region and the motor functions were back here and that we could access this area and uh, utilize that to uh, get the tumor out. Uh, and to uh, stop the seizures at the same time. So uh, using a combination of uh, the technology that we learned with the epilepsy program and with the neuro-oncologist uh, working together, we were able to do quite a few things. Uh, but Rasmussen's encephalitis, uh, I think, is something that really became uh, popularized uh, here uh, at Johns Hopkins because of the vast number of cases that we were doing. Uh, this is a CT scan, and uh, you can see uh, how the two sides look quite different. This is the affected side, and there's a lot of atrophy going on there, so it's not so much that those ventricles are dilated, that's sort of an ex vacuo phenomenon. Something has to, uh, to fill the space as the brain tissue atrophies. And uh, then later on, as MRIs came into place, uh, you can see the fairly dramatic differences between one side of the brain and the other side of the brain. When we first started doing hemispherectomies, that's what we actually did. We took out the hemisphere. So there you see the temporal lobe, occipital lobe, parietal lobe, frontal lobe, all in, in one big fillet. But uh, what 
happened is, uh, I guess it was probably about the seventh or eighth case we were doing, and we were taking out the whole thing that way, and it, it went relatively smoothly, except at the end of the case, the patient didn't wake up, uh, remained uh, in a coma. And, you know, a day went by, two days, three days. Every time I went by the, the room, the parents were there grieving over their decision um, and having second guesses. And a week went by, two weeks went by. She used to love Mr. Rogers. So they were always playing tapes of Mr. Rogers, singing and saying poetry. Didn't wake her up. Three weeks went by, still in a coma, off the ventilator, but still in a coma. Mr. Rogers heard about this little girl, came all the way to Baltimore with all of his puppets to her bedside, tried to wake her up, didn't wake her up. Four weeks went by. It was 2 a.m. in the morning. Her dad was lying on a cot next to her bed, and she said, Daddy, my nose itches. And he was just so shocked. He was so thrilled. He jumped up and he ran out in the hallway shouting. She talked, she talked, only had on his underpants. And everybody came to see what all the commotion was. And, and there she was scratching her nose. And that was the beginning of a rapid recovery in no time. You know, she was walking. She was talking. She wasn't having seizures anymore. Everybody was absolutely thrilled. Then it was time for her to go back to school. Now they began to worry again. She was missing the left half of her brain. Now, how in the world would she be able to do left brain functions like calculating, like math? But she worked so hard, she was so determined that the next year on a math test, she had the highest grade in her class. And she did that with half of her brain. Now, can you imagine what young people could do with a whole brain and determination? And I frequently use that experience when I go around the country talking to groups of young people to help them to realize how incredibly much potential they have. But one of the things that we started thinking about, uh, the pediatric neuroscience group here, is the whole concept of plasticity. Why is it that these children can do so well? And in fact, discovering that you know, they're actually able to transfer functions from one side of the brain to the other side. And our pediatric uh, neurology group here uh, really had a lot to do with uh, popularizing uh, that notion. And we discovered that we could use the hemispherectomies not only for Rasmussen's encephalitis, but for migrational disorders like uh, hemimegencephaly, and even some neuro-oncological problems. This was a, a young child with a cystic primitive neuroectodermal tumor and we did a hemispherectomy and followed by uh, chemotherapy and a child actually did uh, quite well uh, for Sturge-Weber uh, disease, for congenital stroke, uh, really for a large, large number of different types of pathologies. And a lot of the techniques continue to be improved upon uh, even to this day. But, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to uh, the people that worked with me uh, particularly in uh, pediatric neurology uh, because really it was the hemispherectomies that gave me my first 15 minutes of fame. Everybody's supposed to get 15 minutes of fame during their lifetime. Well, that was the first one. Um, and this is uh, at our first uh, pediatric uh, hemispherectomy uh, reunion. Uh, all of these people uh, have had a hemispherectomy. Uh, I, I haven't had one. Uh, and Dr. Vining and Dr. Freeman haven't had one, but other than that, uh, they all had them. And this little girl was actually uh, from Baltimore. All the others are from other parts of the uh, country. And uh, this is the little girl I was just telling you the story about who was uh, in a coma uh, for a month. And this little girl was the very first uh, hemispherectomy. That was the one from Denver uh, who was having 130 seizures a day. And they all have pretty spec. I could uh, just sort of point them all out and tell you uh, just amazing stories about what happened. Well, another interesting thing that happened the very uh, next year after my first hemispherectomy uh, was uh, I was uh, contacted by the chief of obst obstetrics uh, at Sinai, Phil Goldstein, uh, because they had a patient who had twins and one of them had rapidly expanding head hydrocephalus. And um, 
it was expanding so quickly that the mother was going to go into premature labor and uh, they would both be delivered and of course that would mean uh, death for both of them and Phil wanted to know because by that time I uh, me, many people were starting to think that I, I was fairly radical and that I would do anything, which is not true. But anyway, he thought that, so he contacted me and said, um, is there a way that you could operate on this child while it's still in the mother's womb, not so much to save the hydrocephalic child as to save the other one? Well, interestingly enough, you know, three weeks before that, there had been an article in the New England Journal of Medicine about intrauterine surgery and how we just simply weren't ready to begin thinking about that yet. It was uh, too complex. But here was a situation where, you know, we were really trying to save the other twin. We had pretty much given up on the one who had severe hydrocephalus. Well, I contacted uh, Bob Brodner in Philadelphia, who was a neurosurgeon there who had done some experiments on sheep and in putting shunts into them while they were still in the womb in sheep. And we talked and he came down and we messed around a little bit with some equipment and came up with a, a shunt. We had to do all this pretty quickly and we had to get permission to do this experimental surgery which we could not get at Hopkins in that amount of time. There was too much bureaucracy. So we did it over at Sinai. And, um, we actually, with the obstetricians, put in the scope into the uterus, uh, visualized, came up to the fontanelle, pushed the trocar into the brain, into the ventricle, slid the shunt into the uh, ventricle with the other end coming out into the amniotic fluid, and we could actually see the head decompress right there on the ultrasound. And, uh, that uh, pregnancy was then able to continue uh, for several weeks until they had uh, maturation of their pulmonary function. And, uh, and the babies were born. It was a big story. And I, I remember my brother called me up. He was in another part of the country. He said, I just saw you on the uh, CBS Nightly News um, because there was a big firestorm about the case because of the article that had occurred in the New England Journal and people saying that you know we were hot dogs and you know this was a ridiculous thing to do until it became clear that not only did we save the normal baby but the hydrocephalic baby was doing well too after which time they all said well I would have done that too under those circumstances <laughs> but uh, but but the, the whole concept of intrauterine surgery a lot of people think that you know that kind of got started at Philadelphia uh, or at Vanderbilt, but it was actually uh, Dr. Hefes and our department here and Dr. A Alex Haller uh, who began to work on actually being able to remove the fetuses from the sheep and operate on them and then uh, put them back in. And uh, they did some of the, the, the very signal uh, important work to get that started. And uh, it gives you again an example of, of some of the collaborative efforts that have really allowed uh, the department and the division to move forward. And then the, uh, the neuro-oncology program. Again, we didn't have a formal neuro-oncology program uh, when I came back, but uh, Bernie Maria uh, was uh, uh, at the end of his training in pediatric neurology and uh, had also done some work in oncology and was very excited about getting something started. And, uh, you know, Dr. Freeman uh, blessed him to, to really help us put together a uh, neuro-oncology program with a multidisciplinary team. And uh, as a result of that, you know, we started reviewing a lot of very, very difficult uh, pediatric neuro-oncology cases from around the country. And uh, this program continues until today. Uh, the multidisciplinary team is much larger now and is uh, spearheaded by, uh, by Dr. Jallo, Dr. Ahn, Dr. Weingart. Dr. Weingart, I have to admit, has been just a godsend. You know, uh, he trained here and uh, he went away, uh, left us and went to Indiana. And uh, fortunately, uh, 
we were able to recruit him back. And uh, he came back, I think, in 1995 and has always been extraordinarily helpful, particularly with the, uh, the difficult uh, pediatric uh, uh, brain tumor cases. And then uh, Dr. Jallo and, and Dr. Honor, again, taking those programs to yet a different level. But uh, this, was, this was one of the early cases. That this was a kid from uh, Georgia, and uh, he had been diagnosed with a brainstem tumor and had been seen in a, a number of places, the same diagnosis was given. And they ended up here at Johns Hopkins. And uh, when I first saw the kid, he was on a stretcher, barely moving, barely breathing. And uh, nobody knew, uh, or certainly I didn't think there was anything that could be done about this, but they said, we're at Hopkins because you're at Hopkins. We heard about you. We know you're a very good surgeon. We know you have a lot of faith in God. And we want you to take this tumor out. I said, no one can take that tumor out, this brainstem tumor. They said, you can do it. Well, I said, I'll tell you what, let's get an MRI. So we got an MRI. Oh, well, that's not very encouraging looking either. But because of their tremendous persistence and faith, I said, all right, I'll go in, I'll biopsy it. And I went in and took out uh, part of the tumor, fully expecting him to die because it did come back as uh, you know, highly malignant uh, on the frozen section. We took out as much as we could uh, and then we started running across vital things and we said we better stop. And I went out and explained to the parents that, um, sorry, but you know, we can't be successful at everything. And interestingly enough, uh, he started doing better. I expect him to deteriorate. And I said, let's get a, another MRI. And, and this time, you know, you could see uh, a fairly nice plane uh, along the upper part of the brainstem. And I said, is it possible that maybe this was all extra axial and it was just so big and it was compressing and that, there were, that were, therefore we all thought it was an intraaxial tumor and maybe we should go back? And they said, by all means. And uh, we did, in fact, go back. And it turned out that it was all extra axial. Uh, we took it out. And uh, after a few weeks, that boy walked out of the hospital. And today, uh, he is a minister. And that family sends a large donation every year uh, to the uh, hospital for us to give to a family in need. It's really a very touching story. But this was uh, another patient who uh, we discovered was in a nursing home in another state. And uh, that is not a hat, that is a tumor. And uh, in fact, uh, along with the plastic surgeons, and uh, this was a 19-hour operation to resect that and to reconstruct his head. And uh, initially, the baby actually did quite well, and we were thrilled. But after a few weeks, uh, started deteriorating. Virtually all the organs started to fail. Baby died, and we discovered it had metastasized widely throughout the body. But of course, we, we wrote that case up. Uh, with photographs um, and with histological sections so that obviously if anybody sees something like that again they're not going to send it to a nursing home recognizing that really there are things that could be done about it. This was uh, another girl from the south uh, no one thought anything could be done with this lesion and uh, this was at the time when stereotactic craniotomies were first being talked about so we actually did a stereotactic craniotomy. We were able to remove that tumor without causing her uh, any uh, deficits. And, that, and it, was, it was cases like that that really made people think that I would do anything. But I, I wouldn't do anything. All these things were very carefully thought out and worked out uh, with, uh, with the radiologist here, with the uh, functional people here, with the people who had the experience with doing all these different kinds of things. So, you know, none of it was uh, ever just sort of off the cuff. Uh, this uh, young boy was from Oklahoma, and uh, he has this large tumor, which was diagnosed as a brainstem tumor. And uh, he had been biopsied at the University of Oklahoma. They had sent him home and said, you got six months to live, uh, and that was it. And they ended up here at Hopkins. And of course, uh, looking at that tumor from lots of different uh, angles, it, uh, didn't look particularly appealing, but we were able to go in and resect a significant portion of it. Uh, it turned out to be a pilocytic astrocytoma, 
And the interesting thing is the rest of it spontaneously involuted. And uh, that young man I ran into uh, a couple of years ago when I was in Oklahoma. And uh, the family came up to me and said, do you recognize this young man uh, who is a junior at the University of Oklahoma? And I said, I don't recognize him, but he's a very handsome young man. And I said, what's his name? And then they told me, and then I recognized that it was this young man who we had operated on when he was less than a year old. But one of the more difficult uh, tumor cases that I had to deal with actually came in an adult who had Van Hippo Lindau. Uh, it turns out his wife was a nurse on the pediatric uh, neurology neurosurgery service. And uh, he developed one of these uh, mangioblastomas right in the pons, as you can see. And uh, no one could generate any interest uh, in taking care of this surgically. And uh, so she came to me and she said, uh, you know, you do all these things. Uh, you're going to have to take this out. I said, well, I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon. I'm sorry. And she said, well, he's a child at heart, so you're going to have to do this. And uh, I, I said, you know, and I went and I talked to him. I said, if we open your pons and we try to take that lesion out, there's a 50-50 chance you'll die on the table. And he said something extremely mature. He said, if you don't take it out, there's a 100% chance I'm going to die. So given that, uh, we uh, did go in, start taking it out. And interestingly enough, uh, while I was pulling on the capsule of the tumor, the evoked potentials went flat. And uh, that, of course, was uh, very disheartening. Uh, we finished the uh, operation, closed up, but we weren't very excited. But the very next day, uh, he had already been extubated and was up cracking jokes. And uh, so it's a, amazing the kind of things that happen. But, uh, but perhaps uh, the thing that uh, I'm most known for is separation of conjoined twins. And this is actually a picture that comes from the Corpus Scriptorum Historiae Byzantinae, the written history of the Byzantine Empire, a thousand years ago, depicting the first successful separation of conjoined twins. Uh, two boys joined together at the umbilicus. It's not a very good depiction. Uh, and one of them died. They were in Constantinople, and surgeons of the day separated the dead one from the living one, who survived for three whole days, considered a great medical triumph uh, at that time. But um, you know, I got uh, interested in conjoined twins uh, early in my career, started reading a lot about them, trying to figure out why the neurosurgical interventions were so devastating, and concluded that it was exsanguination or bleeding to death. And, um, you know, I was talking to, to Bruce Wright uh, about how they do the pediatric uh, cardiac surgeries, and he was telling me about the hypothermic arrest that he'd done some work with. And uh, lo and behold, a couple of months later, here came these German doctors to present the case of the uh, Bender twins. And um, there you can see their mother, uh, Teresa, and the Bender twins themselves. Very extensive joining, occipital craniopagus. Such twins had never before been separated with both surviving. And she had been told in Europe that she had to choose which twin would live and uh, that they would just cleave whichever one she didn't want off. And she just couldn't make that choice. So they were looking for somebody who had a solution. And I started talking to them about, you know, separating them and using hypothermic arrest at the appropriate time to be able to do the operation. And we started putting together a team here. It was an amazing team. Mark Rogers, uh, who was the chief of uh, pediatric anesthesia at that time, uh, was just masterful in orchestrating the way that it was all put together. And uh, there you can see the twins. Some of us actually went over to Germany uh, to look at them, to put in scalp expanders uh, so that we would have skin to cover over at the end. Uh, we discovered uh, some things that we weren't expecting. For, for instance, uh, you see the vertebrals and the basal systems how they actually joined. And we were saying, well, how in the world can you separate that? Well, you know, that was a major risk we actually took when we separated. We put clamps on it and we cut it. And uh, 
but uh, there were some, some very substantial problems. Uh, there you can see the team uh, operating. We got into bleeding much earlier than we had anticipated. We would only have one hour of hypothermic arrest time. Uh, and uh, we had to go on hypothermic arrest much sooner. And uh, that really changed things. But on hypothermic arrest, this is one of the venous sinuses. Normally, there's blood flowing through there at a high rate. There's nothing there. Cold, pulseless. It's like operating on a cadaver but operating extremely rapidly in order to get things reconstructed. And, uh, and Dr. Wrights and Dr. Cameron were actually looking over our shoulders and they were cutting out pieces of pericardium from the, from the heart that were just the right shapes for this, for various other things, so that we wouldn't have to waste time sewing them back together. We asked people, don't tell us what, how much time there is left because we didn't need the extra pressure. And um, we finished at 59 minutes and some seconds. Um, and um, as we started pumping the blood back in, uh, you could see there was a lot of hemorrhage. Things started swelling. Uh, it was really quite monstrous. But uh, in the long run, they did OK. You can see that they were not suffering nutritionally uh, at that point as well. And then uh, you know, a few years later, there was another similar case in South Africa but they were very, very rapidly deteriorating. And, uh, you know, they summoned uh, if I could come over and help. And we actually did exactly the same operation. Uh, but when we went in to put them on hypothermic arrest, discovered that one of the hearts was just not functioning. It was just fibrillating. And the other one was doing all the cardiac work. And that's the reason they were deteriorating so fast, because as they grew, the one heart could not do all the work they were going into failure. So we got them separated. The one with the good heart actually was doing quite well uh, for the first couple of days and then started seizing and eventually died and it turned out that that one had no kidneys. The other one had the kidneys. So, you know, they were symbiotic in that sense and really points out the, the, the importance when you have twins of that nature to really study them uh, extremely carefully. And uh, that's those. And then a, f a few years later, there was another set. These were from Zambia, but they were going to be done at the Medical University of South Africa. I was a little weary about whether I should go back again, because I was still licking my wounds from the one before that, um, and saying, well, well, if I go back there again and get involved, and they fail, then I would have failed two out of three times. I, I don't know if my ego can take that. And then I said, wait a minute. It's not about your ego. It's about whether those kids can have a normal chance at life. And uh, I said, you should never, ever think a thought like that again. Because of all the gifts and talents that we have as physicians, we can never let ourselves be co-opted by ego and co-opted by peer pressure. We must always remember that our first obligation is to the patient, no matter what the outcome. And, but the interesting thing in studying these, you can see that this common circular sinus is in one phase of the venogram, not full. And that said to me that they probably had the propensity for developing collateral circulation relatively quickly. And that we could, in fact, separate them and cut through that circular sinus, which has always been the thing that has bugged people about that kind of surgery. There have been 13 attempts to separate uh, type 2 vertical craniopagus, which these two were before without success. But uh, by, by concentrating on that area and doing the separation, and the other thing that was a tremendous advantage is we have a 3D workstation over in the outpatient clinic. And I was actually able to drive through all those vessels and practice the operation before actually going over there. So I knew which vessels went to uh, which twin, an enormous advantage. And uh, after a 28-hour surgery, uh, they actually turned out quite well, and they're actually in the eighth grade uh, now. But uh, perhaps the, the one that garnered the most attention around the world was the Bijani twins. And uh, you know they were 28 years old. Uh, women from Iran, Iran, their lifelong goal was to be separated. And they scoured the world looking for a team willing to do that. 
And when they first contacted me, I told them about Chang and Ying Bunker, the original Siamese twins who lived to be 63 years old, never got separated, but they didn't want to hear that. So uh, they ended up with a team in Singapore, and it was a team I had worked with uh, before on uh, some other twins, so somehow they managed to convince me to come and help them against my better judgment. But uh, when I saw those twins, I was just flabbergasted. They were full of personality, they were vivacious, they were smart, they learned to speak English in only seven months, if you can imagine that. They both had college degrees, they both had law degrees, only one won at one, but they both had law degrees. <laughs> so, you know, they, they were incredibly intelligent, they understood, you know, the risk that they were taking. And they said something to me that really struck me, they said, Doctor, we would rather die than spend another day stuck together. And I realized, you know, putting myself in their shoes, what it must be like not to be able to get away from somebody for one second when you have different goals and aspirations. Well, that operation went on, and we were about 90% finished. And some people were starting to celebrate. I was not among them. Because when we got to the very end of the operation, they began to bleed profusely under such force you couldn't stop it. And uh, they exsanguinated. But there were a lot of things that we were able to learn about adult circulation uh, in that. And these are just some of the models uh, that are used to help study the anatomy in these kinds of uh, twins. But you know, this is the, the last case I want to mention. Um, and these were, uh, again, twins from Germany, type 1 uh, craniopagus, Leah and Tabia Block. And the thing that was absolutely fantastic about this case is, you know, I come to the understanding that our neurosurgical department is the most talented neurosurgical department on the face of the earth. And everybody is extraordinary at something. So we actually put together a team composed of the members of our department. Uh, just about everybody was involved. And everybody slotted in when we came to the part of the operation where they were the world expert. And we were literally 10 hours ahead of schedule by doing it that way. And, and what that really points out is the incredible strength that can be derived when you have general excellence that is willing to work together. And that is a theme that I have learned here at Hopkins, but I think it is a, a very important theme for our nation as well. Because, you know, we have so much division in our nation. You know, Republicans don't like Democrats, Democrats don't like Republicans. A wise man once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And that's why, you know, for the last several years, and for the many years, hopefully, to come, I'm going to devote an enormous amount of energy to trying to help our nation to heal. And to recognize that you know, we all have talents, we all have thoughts, we have different ways of doing things, but that doesn't make us enemies. And if we learn how to use that in a thoughtful way, what a tremendous advantage it will be to all of us. And, you know, in medicine, there are enormous advantages that accrue to us in working with children and working with adults and being able to restore them to health. As an intern, you know, when I came here, I was so impressed. I saw all these important people, crown prince of this nation, the king of this place, CEO of this organization, president of this, dying of a glioblastoma. And, you know, every single one of them will give them every title and every penny for a clean bill of health. And, you know, what we get to work with is the most important thing that a person has. And that is their health. There's nothing more important than that. And it doesn't have to be a newsworthy case because it's newsworthy for that patient. It's newsworthy for that family. And I get asked the question all the time, what's the most memorable case you've ever done? And I always say, that's easy. It's the last case that I just did. And it's always memorable when you get to go out and you get to tell that family that their loved one operation was a success and that they're doing well. And there is nothing in the world that is better than that feeling. And those of us who are surgeons, you know, we get a lot of credit for what we do, but I just want to point out the fact that none of us operates in isolation. There's always a whole team of people without whom we could not do what we do. 
We could not do what we do here at Johns Hopkins without the nurses, the technicians, the administrators, all of the people who have a single focus, and that is providing the best care possible for people. And, you know, I hope I continue to have a long life and have an opportunity to do many things. And I, you know, last month my wife and I had an opportunity to go to New Zealand. And what a thrill it was to walk into the, the largest venue that they have in the country and have it filled with thousands of kids who were cheering and just, you know, yelling my name. They, they were so enamored with the story. And uh, in two, less than two months, we go to South Africa to do the dedication of a medical school that's uh, been named after me. And we were recently in Detroit for an inauguration of a high school named after me. And next month, I'll be in Atlanta to give the commencement at Emory, and, and then I go to another school that's named after me there. But you know, all of those are wonderful acknowledgments of the effect that one has had. But of all the acknowledgments, of all the accolades, of all the honors, the greatest one I've ever had is being able to work here at Hopkins with so many great people. Thank you. Wow. Um, that wasn't in any sense a lecture, as far as I could tell. Um, absolute uh, tour de force. So thank you in, in every respect for all of, of this. And um, the inaugural lecture will, will certainly go down as one that's, uh, that's hard to top. Um, I do want to thank, uh, on behalf of the department, um, on behalf of Dr. Carson, Dr. Brem, and others, um, several of the other chiefs who are here today who um, have, have worked tirelessly to help create this culture, this interdisciplinary culture, this culture of, um, of creativity. I can't see up top now, but um, Dr. Dover was here, uh, director of Children's Center and chief of pediatrics, obviously a significant support for, for Dr. Carson's work. Um, Peter McDonnell is here, who's chair of Wilmer, Alan Parton, um, Chair of Urology, and David uh, Eisel, who's um, Chair as well. And really, uh, what, what an evening. We have been uh, rewarded um, uh, to this incredible lecture, and, and my personal reaction is that um, the lineage of Harvey Cushing uh, lives, certainly, in the groundbreaking work um, of Dr. Brim, uh, Dr. Q, uh, certainly Dr. Carson, who is the focus today, and, and the absolute who's who of, of neurosurgeons that have been assembled at Hopkins. Uh, clearly testimony to the incredible power uh, of intellectual pursuit and, and the ethical command of uh, of medicine in service of, of humanity. R remarkable stuff, and thank you for all of you for filling our afternoon um, with this wonderful insights. Every aspect of your professional lives at Hopkins have been devoted to patient care, and your clinical work, your research are designed to clarify conditions and diseases um, and to develop treatments that are applicable worldwide and, and the scope of your uh, impact, the scope of, um, of the community of, of doctors at Hopkins uh, impact is, is, is truly amazing. We hope that all of you will continue to uh, come to, uh, uh, to know these lectures as, um, as a milestone during the course of, of a year or beyond um, and share with us and 
uh, with the department the excitement of pushing forward the boundaries uh, of what we can do for uh, the patients at Johns Hopkins uh, and those around the world. So with that, thank you very, very much for coming, for attending the inaugural Harvey Cushing Lecture, Dr. Carson, for enthralling us with, with your words and your deeds, um, and to all a, a, a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>